Hello and welcome back to Bicycle Legs and another edition of Bicycle Legs Discovers Rush. And for the first time in this series, we have a return guest, Mr. Alex Nelson from Rush Bands. Alex, thank you so much for joining me once again on the show. My pleasure. I love talking about Rush and <laughs> discovering these albums with you all over again is great fun. <laughs> so when I originally approached Alex to do the show the first time, we did signals in the last program that the two of us did together he actually said that he had two albums that he had picked out for me uh and so the other one is as you will have seen from the thumbnail hemispheres and that's the album that we're going to be talking about today so if alex if you could give us a little bit of background behind hemispheres uh, you know a little bit about when the album was released and what it was about and that sort of thing and most importantly why did you select this one for me as well as signals fantastic uh, Hemispheres is Rush's sixth studio album, released in October of 1978. Did pretty well in the charts. Um, the album was recorded uh, in England, and uh, I believe it reached uh, 14 in Canada and the UK, and 41 in the United States, and it was certified platinum uh, in 1993. Wow. And so why'd you pick this one for me when you were sort of choosing albums for me? The first track um, is probably my second favorite Rush song ever. Um, it's an epic, you know, it's incredibly long. Um, and I just love Rush's long epic songs that tell a, a very involved story. Uh, and they like it even more because it's part two of Cygnus X1, which we'll get into later. But uh, I love these kinds of groups of songs that Rush puts together across albums. And then, of course, musically, uh, the song Hemispheres is simply mind-blowing. Uh, I was in a band in college, and we attempted to play uh, the first part of the song, uh, the introduction, uh, and gave it our best shot. But uh, it was, it was very, very challenging. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I just, and then of course, being only four songs on the record, uh, you, you would expect the other ones uh, to be very good. And they are, the other three songs are on the second side of the album are absolutely fantastic. So just all in all, this is a, a spectacular Rush album. And in my opinion, um, this was the band's peak of the seventies era, you know, pre moving pictures. Yeah. No. Well, that's great. Um, I was looking forward to doing this album after I did um, A Farewell to Kings with Ryan Gavalier um, because I really, really liked A Farewell to Kings. It's probably second or third favourite of the Rush albums that I've done so far. And um, I've been told that A Farewell to Kings and Hemispheres are kind of part one and part two as it were, not just because of Cygnus X1, but just the feel of the albums together sort of have mm -hmm. a very similar feel. I believe they were recorded in the same studio and that sort of thing. Correct. So, yep. um, so yeah, I was definitely looking forward to this one. Um, so that's why I sort of wanted you to come back on the show and, and do this one with me. Um, so as you alluded to, the album starts with Cygnus X1 Book 2 Hemispheres. Uh, and this, of course, runs straight off of the last track from A Farewell to Kings, which is the Cygnus X1 book one. Um, I noticed, though, that like book one lyrically is very sort of science fiction, um, mm -hmm. whereas this one seems to be more about sort of Greco-Roman mythology and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. You know, you've got the gods Apollo and... Dionysus and 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 things like that in the lyrics. So I thought that was an interesting shift to sort of meld those two things, sort of science fiction and Greco-Roman uh, mythology was was a really interesting thing to do. Um, quick question before we sort of get into it: Did Rush ever sort of play Book One and Book Two together, like on stage, like play them as one sort of long extended piece? Not that I've ever heard, although that would be incredible because Subrush fans have speculated in the past that parts of book one and book two would make better sense if they were actually mixed together instead of played book one and book two back to back. People have cut and paste, you know, with the 
modern uh, digital audio workstations and and piece the songs together, much like uh, uh, in Rainbows and uh, um, the other Radiohead album that I forget goes with in Rainbows. But uh, people have tried that in the past and speculated upon that. But no, I've I've never seen them play it back to back, which would absolutely be spectacular if they did. Yeah, no, fair enough. So um, we, again, you know, as with the sort of long tracks on A Farewell to Kings, we sort of get like three minutes or so of instrumental mm-hmm. introduction before the, the prelude ha- actually does have some lyrics at the, the end of it. Um, the other thing I noted too is that this track in particular, like the the epics on A Farewell to Kings, the long tracks, that like even though they were long there weren't a lot of lyrics like you know like a good half of those two big long tracks on a farewell to kings are instrumental whereas this one this song has a lot of lyrics it does you know it it tells a really long involved story um so um so yeah you know we get the prelude it it sort of you know, mostly instrumental, but then we get the sort of introductory lyrics. Uh, and then we go into the Apollo bringer of wisdom section after a short pause. Like that that's the thing too. It almost like at the end of the prelude, it almost comes to a full stop before the song sort of starts up again. Um, and um, yeah. Um and it sort of alternates between halftime and double time musically, which I, I always love it when Rush does that. I've noticed them do that a fair bit on these, especially on these seventies albums, like a farewell to Kings and um, uh, fly by night and things like that. They would do this sort of halftime, then double time or double time, then halftime. Um, and um, there's some, also some really tricky time signatures in this section, which is really cool. Um you get a really crushing uh, Alex solo at the end of the, the, the Apollo part. Mm-hmm. Interestingly, just as a slight, sort of slight tangent, I realized recently that I was familiar with Alex's playing before I'd listened to any rush because mm-hmm. in the car just recently, I've been listening to the discography of the band Porcupine Tree. And Alex plays this absolutely wonderful solo on their song Anesthetize from the Fear of a Blank Planet album. And um, so, yeah, you know, I'd, I'd, actually already, I'd already known some of his playing before I started really exploring the Rush catalogue, which is kind of cool. So that solo leads us into the sort of Dionysus bringer of love section. Musically, this section is pretty much the same as the Apollo section. It's kind of, you know, mm-hmm. verse one, verse two, as it were. Um, you know, um, the key. But the winter right? fell upon them and it caught yeah. them unprepared. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, the keyboards are subtle but effective on this song. I really like them. Um mm-hmm. Then we get into the Armageddon section, as, as you're kind of alluding to there, which starts with some more really great guitar work. Um, there's some really lovely syncopated playing by Neil in this section, in the verses. Um, it's a really cool rocking section. I really, really like it. The other thing I noticed about this epic, as opposed to like just recently I did uh, Caress of Steel, and of course, you've got sidelong track on that album with uh, uh, Fountain of Lamneth. Fountain of Lamneth, yes. Mm-hmm. And um, the thing I noted about that one at the time was that I really liked that track, but it didn't cohere all that well. Like the, the individual sections felt like individual sections that had kind of been stitched together, um, almost Frankenstein monster style, as it were. Mm-hmm. This epic flows a lot better than um, Fountain of Lamneth does. Um, and then we um, we get the Cygnus Bringer of Balance section, and that starts sort of really quiet and eerie, which is really cool. Getty singing in his lower register, which, you know, in the 70s we hadn't heard a lot of, you know, mostly he's sort of high-pitched shrieking Getty, and I love that mm-hmm. too. But... Um, <laughs> 
but he's he's getting into his lower register here, um, which is really really cool. Um, it's sort of mostly synth and sound effects, a little bit of guitar here and there, um, and then it sort of kicks in to a more sort of heavy section, um, and then sort of the the and then it, it, it you know this section kind of comes to a big climax at the end it, it switches yeah it switches to a very um like a very positive chord progression very upbeat not quite so dark and gloomy in the other two parts like that that final section is very um it's very uh, positive it's very uplifting yeah but at, as i say it comes to this sort of climax and you if if you're not sort of looking at the the timer at the end of the song you know if you, you you know, I've been listening to these on Spotify, so you can mm -hmm. sort of see the the how much longer there is to go in the song. But if you're not looking at that, you might think, well, that's the end of the song, <laughs> right? Because it really does, especially with the big gong at the very end. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But then you have this sort of coda that is the the sphere section, mm -hmm. which um, really ties it up all brilliantly. Um, it's you know a sort of a gentle end to this this epic epic piece. Mm -hmm. um, I absolutely love this. Although I must say, this one took me two or three listens before I really sort of got all the detail in it. Mm -hmm. um, the the first time I listened to it, I I will admit I was a little underwhelmed. I was expecting it to be, you know, I don't know what I was expecting, but. There's a subtlety to this, even though it's a big, bombastic epic. There's also a subtlety to this where you've really got to sit and listen to some of the bits to really get the intricacies of it. Um, but once you sit Especially down the and, drums, too. Yeah, the, absolutely. The, the, there's so many drum parts. That, and Neil never plays the same section, the, the, you know, the exact same way every time. There's always little subtle changes. The fills at the end of each phrase are a little bit different. It's... I mean, it's it's an absolute masterclass in progressive rock drumming. Yeah, absolutely. So it, it's a it's um it's a piece that I think reveals its its self when you sit down and listen to it a lot more detailed. Just sort of listening to it first time without you know sort of really sort of putting your listening ears on, it may mm -hmm. kind of pass you by a little bit, which it did for me. But when I sat down and really sort of started digging deep into it, that's when it revealed all all these lovely bits and pieces to it. So it's a, a wonderful epic. Um, I mean, I haven't done 2112 yet. I think I'm doing that one in February. But um, so far, I think for the sidelong epics between this and Fountain of Lamneth, this one definitely sort of wins hands down. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Yeah. So then we get on to side two of the record uh, and we get the song Circumstances, which is a rocker, but it's mm -hmm. quite a prog it's quite a proggy one. Um, you know, unlike like some of the earlier 70s albums that have done, like uh, Caress of Steel and uh, even Farewell to Kings, you would get the long tracks that would be kind of proggy and all that sort of thing. But then the shorter tracks would tend to be sort of straight ahead, hard rock. Mm -hmm. On this album, even the shorter tracks have those sort of proggy elements to them, I noticed. Right, because Six uh, Circumstances in the Middle comes to a screeching halt, and mm. they start that goofy, really interesting and awesome middle section with the keyboard solo and uh, Neil playing the um, glockenspiel. Uh, and then it and then it breaks off and you know breakneck speed into a complete proggy you know 25 30 bar section and then goes back into into the uh into the chorus so yeah i mean that this song may be only four minutes long or gosh i can't remember how exactly yeah. how long it is um yeah three minutes and 42 seconds long but <laughs> it fits a, a crazy amount of intense progressive rock in that tiny little middle you know, 40 sec, 45 second span. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the lyric is sort of a time old message of sort of the more, the more things change, the more they say the same, mm -hmm. um, which I noticed they kind of emphasize that by not just singing it in English, but singing it in French as well. French. Yep. Absolutely. Um, which is a nice thing for a, 
Canadian band to do, seeing as you know Canada is <laughs> a, a bilingual country and all that sort of thing. Right. Even though but Toronto's yeah. in Ontario, not in Quebec. Quebec yeah, being no, no, no. Great, but much more French than. <laughs> yes. But definitely. Yep. Absolutely. Funnily enough, the only part of Canada I've been to is Quebec. Um, oh, really? I've, yeah. yeah, I've been to Montreal and I've been to Quebec City. Mm. And um, great places. I definitely recommend them if you ever get the chance to travel. But um, yeah, um, as you mentioned, that's sort of the section in the middle. Um, you get this really delightful quiet section i i love it um as you said the synths and the glockenspiel and all that sort of thing and then it leads to some really really cool riffing and some very yep. very technical drumming from neil yep um, huge build up yeah and then you get the chorus come back in at the end and just sort of wrap it all up as you say you know this is the sort of thing where i think a lot of other progressive bands would have extended this into an eight, nine, ten minute track. Yeah, possibly. And they've and they've done it in under four and and still had the same sort of amount of information, as it were, in that track. <laughs> yep. it, it's a very dense track, but I really, really love it. It's really it definitely cool. was not verbose. It uh they like you said, they packed a lot of really great progressive rock into a three and three quarter minute long song. Yeah. And also I want to call attention to Getty's bass playing in this song. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole the whole album has just fantastic, you know, virtuoso bass playing by Getty. But this song in particular, if you concentrate on just listening to the bass lines, they're incredible and they're very technical. And I, I can't believe the guy sings and plays those bass lines at the same time. They're absolutely incredible. Yeah, absolutely. Not exactly the same, but I do compare him a little bit with someone like uh, Chris Squire as far right. as sort of bass lines that are very melodic mm -hmm. and and that sort of thing. And Chris Squire, although he wasn't the lead singer in Yes, he did a lot of backing vocals. So he, he was often singing and playing at the same time as well. Yep. So um, Well, both Getty and Chris Squire have a, a knack for finding the root of the particular chord that's happening in a, in a very unique place, but mm. not losing sight of the actual low frequency noise that needs to be created to to make a, a song sound full uh, yeah. both of them just absolutely nail it when it comes to writing parts that make sense and 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 to your ear it doesn't feel like he's out trying to like interfere with the guitar or keyboards or something else that they're holding down that bass line that makes a lot of sense and esquire uh, and john entwistle too those guys all just play crazy progressive rock bass but always seem to find uh, a good place to land uh, on the roots of each of the chords so that it makes sense to your ear yeah absolutely and of course you know both getty and chris at this stage of their careers anyway were playing those wonderful rickenbacker basses as well so. <laughs> <You're sure. laughs> yep i've always wanted one of those yeah but, they're um, beautiful yeah so then we get the trees um, which starts with some really sort of lovely classical guitar. Um, I'm assuming that's Alex playing it because I know that yes. on some of the early records, there's been a little bit of classical guitar played by Getty, but I, I assume that's Alex playing it this time. Yeah, I've seen this song live a dozen times and uh, it's always his little nylon string, beautiful electric uh, uh, nylon electric uh, classical guitar, like absolutely, absolutely beautiful. Uh, at one point in time, uh, multiple times he would have that guitar on a stand and he would just walk up to it and play the yeah. intro to the song and then he would be wearing his electric guitar. So yeah. really, really beautiful. Yeah. So it starts with that beautiful classical guitar. You've got some bass. You've got Getty again singing in the lower register mm -hmm. um, before the then the main song sort of kicks in after that. Um, the lyric seems to me to be sort of using the oaks and the maples uh, as a metaphor for sort of human conflict. Mm -hmm. um, and in the end, you know, everybody's equal only in death sort of thing, you know, because right. they, they end up equal because they end up getting cut down. Cut down, right. But, but um, you know, so quite a poignant lyric when you think of it that way. Absolutely. Um, I always thought of it as a struggle between uh, corporations and workers or something like that. It just, it, the metaphor can apply to so many different places. It's, it's yeah. 
No, that's a that's a good reading of it too, actually. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lovely synth solo in the middle of this too. I really, really like that. It's probably the the song with the most sort of overt keyboard in it, except for maybe mm -hmm. the one we're going to talk about after this. Yes. Um, you know, um, you get the chiming guitars, and it sort of gives to me th that synth and the chiming guitar that. Alex is playing gives it a really sort of early Genesis feel, you know, sort of mm -hmm. like 73, 74 Genesis sort of thing going. Uh, and then you get a really lyrical guitar solo from Alex in the second half of the song, which is just absolutely gorgeous. So again, you know, a four minute song, but they get a lot done in it. Yep. It's beautiful. Uh, it, you know, it's a, it's a fan favorite too. They played it a lot on tour. Uh, in many, many different tours. Uh, it, it, people just absolutely love it. Yeah. Oh, for good reason. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then we get the legendary La Villa Strangiado. I've, you know, I've been in some Rush groups over the last few months on Facebook because, you know, I like to sort of see what other Rush fans sort of think about things. And also, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, you know, post my videos there when they come out and that sort of thing. Um, there's a lot of talk about this track. There is. <laughs> um, you know, it's a nine and a half minute instrumental broken into 12 sections. So I'm not even going to try, as I said to you before we came on air, I'm not even going to try and break this down into the individual sections because some of these sections are sort of 15, 20 seconds long. It would be kind of ridiculous, I think, to try and analyze each and indiv each individual section. But um, like the trees, this starts with sort of, you know, uh, it um, sort of classical guitar at the beginning uh, before you sort of get chiming guitars and synths coming in. Um, there's some really great cymbal work from uh, Neil at this sort of this introductory part. You know, he's just doing these lovely little washes on the cymbals and that sort of thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then again, I'm again I'm getting a bit of that sort of early Genesis vibe with this sort of early part of it. Um, and then we get some power chords coming in and sort of completely changing the 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 way the the piece goes. And then we but get introducing what, what we we would probably assume it's like the chorus of the yeah. song, which repeats itself several times. That's like the big like explosion of of chords and 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 a, a theme that happens later on in the song several times. Yeah, well, I described it in my notes as the main theme. The main theme, so, yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah, it's a really cool, complex tune. I love it, and I, I love mm -hmm. that it sort of sort of keeps uh, bringing itself back as the piece goes. And then we get this quiet piece with sort of tone pedal guitar and then some sort of jazzy guitar from Alex. Mm -hmm. Um, which is not something I've heard him sort of do a lot on the the Rush albums that I've listened to so far. He doesn't tend to – he tends to be more of a rock player rather mm -hmm. than a jazzy player, but he gets really jazzy here, and I really like that. Um, it's yeah, really it's very clean this. tone too. It's, there's no distortion. Uh, Neil's playing a very cool but syncopated uh, drum beat underneath it that's really cool, which is one of the very first Neil drum beats that I ever got to learn on, on – drums because it's not super difficult but super yeah. super uh slick and and very very beautiful and very perfect like fit for that part of the song yeah absolutely and then there's a great solo from alex thumbs up and then you get the synth adding some sort of creepiness to this mm -hmm. the circumstances which i really like i think this is I, I could be wrong but i think we're in the sort of the monsters section here right the um, first the first monsters yeah yeah um, and then they start playing a piece of music that I already knew, which is <laughs> um, Raymond Scott's Powerhouse. Right. You know, and people who've um, not listened to Rush but have watched, you know, as I did when I was a kid, watched lots of um, Warner Brothers cartoons, mm -hmm. you know, would know this piece of music. Yep. Yeah. Um, and funnily enough, this connects Rush to a band that I absolutely adore, 
that you would not think of in Rush terms. Like uh, they're a band I don't think could be much further away from Rush. <laughs> and that is um, They Might Be Giants. They Might Be Giants. I knew you were going to say that. Yep. Yeah. That's awesome. Because yeah. they they use that piece of music, the powerhouse from Raymond Scott, in a in a uh, song called Rhythm Section Want Ad. Nice. So, um, yeah, it's it's a really interesting connection there. Um, uh, I, I I made a note of Bet Getty's bass in these sections too. It's uh, really really incredible. Um, you know, you were saying earlier how his bass playing is so great on the whole album this is where mm-hmm. i sort of really was paying attention to his bass um that, as we get he reproduces that little that that one bass line that's kind of signature for the song that little yeah. solo with the little with the jazz drumming behind it every time i've seen the song played live he just absolutely nails that bass line it's it's so amazing yeah and then we get a section that's sort of in three four which again, mm-hmm. I always love it when they're changing time signatures and that sort of thing. And then we get the powerhouse theme returns and then the main theme. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it all ends very abruptly. <laughs> it does. <laughs> you know, it like it just sort of comes to a screeching halt. And I just go, Ba-dink! you know. Yeah. Just, yeah. And that's it. But it's it's a it's a great end to a a great album i love this in- i love it when rush do instrumentals mm-hmm. um i think the ones i've been exposed to so far were i mean the first one i experienced was leave that thing alone right on uh was that counterparts oh no counterparts isn't it i haven't done the bones yet oh, okay cool um and then um obviously oh, where's my things on yep. yeah and then of course yyz from yep. um from moving, uh, pictures. moving pictures yeah no yeah. they they just absolutely knock it out of the park as far as i'm concerned every time they do an instrumental as much as i love the you know great vocal band you know getty's a great singer and obviously neil writes some incredible lyrics but when this mm-hmm. band goes into instrumental mode i just absolutely <laughs> adore it <laughs> yeah. I you know you. so in the end you know, this album, as I said earlier when we were talking about the first track, this album wasn't as immediate for me as, say, A Farewell to Kings was. Farewell to Kings, first time I played that, I instantly loved it. Mm-hmm. This one took me a couple of listens, but once I gave it that time, it's right up there with A Farewell to Kings. Um, you know, those two albums in particular, to me, are sort of the peak prog period mm-hmm. for Rush. You know, after this, they would do permanent waves and moving pictures, and they would start moving towards being a little bit more concise. Um, I still love those albums, but um, yeah, this is an absolutely wonderful album. It's definitely one I'm going to have to track down a copy of and uh, add to my Rush collection. So, um, it's... thank you so much for for introducing me to this one. Sorry, what were we going to say? Of course, no, I I, I love it. I. There's some some really interesting notes about just the production and the time that Rush took mm-hmm. to do this album. They recorded it over two months, and they only took one day off during that whole two month period of time, Ooh. which is absolutely mind blowing. Yeah. Uh, there's notes that I've read across the internet where Neil has said or Getty has said that it took him 40 takes to do La Vida Strangiado, um, which is crazy because 40 takes for any song is beyond you know, any reasonable amount of time to spend on, on one song. Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, it, it really turned out uh, great. Um, and uh, they, the speculation at the time was that they spent a hundred thousand dollars recording this album, which is also unbelievable because the previous two albums, um, uh, a Farewell to Kings took them about four weeks to record, and most of their other albums prior to A Farewell to Kings were somewhere between three and five weeks. So to go from roughly three to five weeks on most albums to go to two months to record this album just tells you how much time they spent painstakingly writing and recording and, you know, just going over and over and over the the thoughts and the, the musical ideas on this album to get them perfect, which yeah. also 
just blows my mind and it also contributes to one of the reasons why i love this album so much is they they put every possible ounce of musical energy into it and the product really shows yeah absolutely yeah no it's a wonderful album no doubt about that please let us know in the comments what you think of um rush's hemispheres um if you're a big rush fan please let us know sort of your thoughts on the various tracks if you're new to rush like me please go and have a listen to this on your listening app of choice and tell us what you think in the comments, you know, where you agree with us, where you maybe disagree with us. Absolutely wonderful. Please do go and follow the Rush fans uh, social media pages. I will be leaving links for those in the description. Alex is sort of, you know, well involved with the Rush fans group. He's in a lot of the, the discussions they have and all that sort of thing. So please do go and check that out. Please do like, share, and subscribe. It really does help the channel out. If you're new to the channel, please go and have a look at some of my other videos. Everything's playlisted. So if you want to have a look at some of my other Bicycle Eggs Discovers Rush episodes, there's a playlist for those. If you want to see some of my studio albums rank shows, there's a playlist for those. If you want to see my appearances on other people's channels, I also have a playlist for those. If you want to follow me on social media, I'm at Bicycle Eggs on Instagram and Twitter. And I now have a dedicated Bicycle Legs Facebook page. Please come and give those all a follow and join in the conversation. I'd really love to have you there. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.